Holly Randall Unfiltered is brought to you by our friends at Manscaped. Their Lawnmower 3.0 is a revolutionary electric trimmer that won't nick or snag your nuts. So go to manscaped.com and use code Holly to get 20% off plus free shipping. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Holly Randall Unfiltered. I am really excited for my guest today. This is a very special one. I have Rachel Mason, the incredible director of the now streaming documentary Circus of Books. Rachel, how are you? Hey, I'm awesome, Holly. How are you doing? I'm great. I'm great. Um, Thank you so much for coming on. I'm so excited to talk to you about this incredible documentary. I realized when I did the intro, I didn't actually mention that it's streaming on Netflix because of course there are several different platforms. So everybody is Netflix. So you guys got to go check this out. Um, give us a little quick like spiel about what Circus of Books is about. So um, in a nutshell, it's about the fact that my parents ran one of the biggest gay adult businesses in Los Angeles for over 40 years and kind of kept that as a bit of a secret from me and my brothers. And uh, growing up, I didn't realize that they were involved in something as cool and edgy and interesting as being in the gay porn business. But, um, you know, over the years, I realized that the, the role of the store, Circus of Books, and then also the role of their production company, Video 10, in output in terms of just actual gay porn that they were really involved in producing. Some of the iconic things that we know of in, in gay porn, like Jeff Stryker's movies and, you know, just also the many different um, um, variations of titles that came out on Video 10. So it's a, it's a movie about my parents' store, its impact, but it's also about the fact that they lived through one of the saddest periods in history for gay men in particular, which was through the AIDS crisis, the 1980s, 1990s, and the role of the store and of porn in sort of making a, a community come together, which people don't realize, you know, a lot of people, as we all know, um, have a lot of opinions about porn, but one opinion that I don't think really came to be ever given the time of day until I spent time making this film was that a there's a family business operation that is at the center of this store, but many stores, you know, look at you guys have in some ways a family operation. Larry Flint has a family operation. This is a business with family operations. And for the most part, these are wholesome families. So when the Christian right likes to come down on the industry for being anti-family, I like to make that point that this is a very wholesome family business even though you can say whatever you want about adult material. So I'm giving you the longest windedest answer, but um, it's about a lot of different things packed into <laughs> this film. Yeah. I mean, what really drew me and, and touched me in a way about your film is, and, and we've discussed this is that you and I have so many parallels, you know, we both come from a family that worked in the adult industry. We both come from, like a stable, loving family that like on one side seems like this perfectly normal suburban home. But then, you know, on the other side, they just happen to have this career, which is a little bit more salacious than the normal. And, um, you know, trying to get people to understand that just because you're involved in the adult industry, it doesn't make you some kind of criminal or some kind of sociopath or, you know, and that how we can be very normal loving people who happen to have, you know, sort of fallen into this, uh, this career. So tell me a little bit about your parents, because uh, your mother and my mother are very similar in so many ways. Mm -hmm. And I think it's like, the fact that they come across as such a normal, I wouldn't think they work in porn couple is what's so fascinating about the film. Well, I mean, the funny thing about our moms, I would love to throw out there is that 
even though they are normal, they're, they're both powerhouses. I mean, mm-hmm. Karen Mason is maybe the, the less well-known in the industry, but I, I used to always hear stories from people like in the, in the gay porn world. I mean, I will say that I'm very tied to gay porn, not so much straight porn, but in the gay porn universe, my mom had a reputation that was formidable. Like people were like a little scared of my mom. She was like a big force. And I would say the same thing for your mom. You know, she's a formidable legend in the industry. And so on the one hand, they both are probably the same generation and they can't, they had to fight their way to just earn that respect. And, um, you know, I think you and I being a similar generation, look at what they did with this sense of like, wow, that's so cool. But also like our generation has different battles to fight. And so, you know, we have a, we have like a different perspective on their battles in some ways. So the only difference I will say, which might be a pretty significant difference is that your mom and my mom, my mom was actually very religiously conservative, which is at such at odds on some primal level with being in this industry in the way that she was conservative with, with you know, with all that goes into gay porn specifically, including, you know, gayness being something that a lot of religious people have trouble with, which included my mom. So it's like, that was kind of the central point that I made my doc focus on is like, how does a person have so many contradictions? Like she had the ability to be so warm and so beautiful to these gay men that were actually you know, left behind by their own families because of religious beliefs. So my mom overrode her own religious beliefs in order to be there for all these guys. But when it came to her own son, my brother, who, spoiler alert, he's gay, and I talk about that in the film, my mom struggled with that. So the question of like how we deal with contradictions, and I don't know the, all the contradictions buried in your mom. I'm sure there's a great doc there that we've talked about, but your mom's story, I'm sure has some of these buried truths that, you know, that's kind of where a doc comes from is like, what, what is the journey of a person's contradictions? So, um, yeah, I guess I, I don't know if I answered the question exactly, but it's, it's really interesting to think about women who are maverick women of that generation. And I think our, our moms certainly um, Mm -hmm. are share that. (laughs) Yeah. Um, I want to extrapolate a little bit more on your mother's struggle with coming to terms, the fact that her son was gay. Um, and the fact that, you know, yet she worked in the gay industry, um, which obviously was perfectly fine when it came to looking at it as a career, but when it, it came into her own family, how she struggled with that. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah. I mean, you know, I will look at some things with my mom with a grain of the AIDS crisis looming over it, which is, Mm. you know, not to be, uh, it's not a small thing when, when my parents were at the height of their business's success, in some ways, it was also the height of the tragedy that was just a mind blowing tragedy. I mean, it, 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 it's up there with like, when you think about the Holocaust, like people just dying, 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 or, or, I mean, it's crazy. It sounds like COVID we're in the state right now. I mean, it's a, it's a shocking amount of death that you're absorbing on a daily basis. But what happened during the AIDS crisis, um, I don't know if people who are of a certain generation who are too young to remember, but being gay was so vilified in the mainstream. Like you, I mean, the the word fag was just out there. It was part of the culture of like, it was not cool to be gay. It was not even okay to be gay. It was a really bad, terrible thing to be gay in the mainstream, you know? So from all the way from politicians to school teachers, you know, you just like, it was not acceptable in our culture. So I remember growing up, Um, you know, hearing about AIDS as like you probably did too, is sort of a mysterious thing because I think in some ways it was kept a secret because it was tied to something that first off was shameful being gay, but secondly, sex, which was like even more shameful. So there was like this merger of these two giant shameful things. And so for my mom, um, you know, I was always the, the one in my family that was a weirdo, an artist, queer even. And, and it didn't even seem to raise a eye, like eyebrow for them that, you know, I, I took a girl to prom, my friend to this day, Annie, and like all these different things that, I, you know, all of my friends were drag queens. Like I, I was in the gayest possible space ever. And yet my brother, Josh was like, 
a Pete Buttigieg kind of gay. Like he was so perfect. Like he was too perfect. He was just this like most perfect child imaginable, which in retrospect, I look at as his probably really terrible struggle with trying to shield my mom from the disappointment of his quote imperfection, which is his gayness, which is like, again, it's so painful to think Mm -hmm. that like he would have been feeling that. But when you look at the store and the weight of what my parents dealt with as a, as a tragic experience for gay men, Josh is like walking into that world. And so I think my mom's first reaction when she, you know, in her mind was like, my God, the, you know, the Lord is punishing me, you know, this horrible like vision of, you know, fire and brimstone. Like I knew, you know, I should have never had this business. Like in her mind, she was doing something wrong and this was God's way of punishing her for it by giving her a gay child. And and she said those words, but, you know, she quickly re- retracted them and, and came around after a year of really powerful um, rethinking. And I will say, because this does seem to go unnoticed by some people, which is like to think of my mom as like a homophobic bigot. Well, my mom had a year of struggling with Josh, but she's had like 20 to 25 years now of being the most powerful advocate for LGBT parents that I know. She she doesn't miss a, a Wednesday PFLAG meeting. And, and PFLAG is parents and friends of LGBT youth. And she is there for parents literally all over the world that struggle with their kids. And she's done it for 20 years. So, you know, I think it's, you can only redeem yourself and, and come out of a situation like that if you've gone there like she did. So she really did have, you know, a reaction that's similar to many other religious people. So um, that's, that's mm-hmm. her struggle with it. And I think it came from witnessing the AIDS crisis and seeing how, how tragic that was. And she really didn't want my brother experiencing any of that. Yeah. Yeah. There is a, you know, towards the end of the film, you see her marching for, I think it is for, is, is it a P march that she's. Yeah. It's she's a P flag for? March within the, um, the gay pride parade. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you see her, you know, talking about how she, you know, went through this and she came to the realization and the acceptance of and and embracing really her son being gay. And I think, um, you know, what's really the most touching for people is seeing someone else's journey and seeing how someone's mind can be changed, um, Mm -hmm. by, you know, um, learning and knowledge and, um, and love really. And I've experienced some of that myself. It's kind of funny. This is an interesting sort of segue and I don't want to get away from the documentary because there's still so much I want to talk about, but this podcast has actually been an incredible experience for me in terms of me learning about other people and learning about, um, different sexual orientations and Mm -hmm. gender identification and, and it's been such a wonderfully educating experience for me. And actually your partner, mm-hmm. Buck Angel, was one of my favorite guests still to this day who taught me so much about what it's like to be trans. And, you know, I came into doing this podcast with absolutely no real knowledge or idea of, of what his struggles have been and, and, and you know, how he has grown as a person and accepted you know, who he, who he really is. And so I always credit Buck with like really giving me a wonderful education about transgender identity. And, um, and it's just so awesome when I found out that you were his partner because I just adore him and like, well, you know, great man. Yeah. I have to say, well, that's awesome to hear. I'm sure he'll love knowing that, that his interview made such an impact, but he's really, I mean, I will say this, um, you know, I guess I'm going to be that, like that proud partner. Um, but I really do think Buck is a rare person in his ability to communicate his experience from like the most difficult and painful time in his life to the present. And I, I think one of the coolest things about Buck's message, at least for me as someone that, you know, has this very personal tie to the porn industry, like, like you as well, is that, you know, for me, I grew up under the shadow. I mean, I, you and I must have a difference here because your, your mother was like, you know, true career woman who like made this awesome thing that I don't think she was ashamed of. Whereas my mom was like deeply ashamed of it and had to hide it. So I always Mm -hmm. grew up feeling like, God, there's gotta be people who are proud of this work because, you know, like 
it's not something to not be proud of. Like it's something to be like amazed by. I mean, first off, you have to be brave as fuck to be in this business, like the bravery. And I guess, you know, people look at a lot of, you know, a lot of the people in porn, I would say from the outside are viewed without any knowledge of like what it must be really like to do this work. And, you know, people have all kinds of judgments, but once you're inside, you know, it's, it's really important to find the people that are proud of it and that the work itself did something to shape their lives. And to me, Buck's message is like pretty much one of the most powerful messages that is out there about how porn basically saved him and also saved millions of other people. Like Buck became the image of what it means to be a trans man and be proud of your body and to be completely okay with having a vagina on a man's body and like that inherent contradiction becoming completely okay. And, and, and like normalized for, you know, for this group of people that otherwise would be just, they wouldn't see themselves anywhere. And so I saw that in my film with gay men specifically, I really, I mean, I talked to guys who the minute they would talk about circus of books, it would be like a Vietnam vet who like, you know, came out of the military didn't know that there even was another gay person alive. And then got into the store and saw just magazines. It's so quaint, you know, like they would see like the image of a, you know, a nude gay man in a magazine. And they were suddenly feeling like they were not alone in the entire world. Well, Buck did that for trans guys. And, you know, his like, his ability to be alive and tell the story is also really profound because I will say when I, when I think of all the gay male porn stars that did that work at the seminal time, like in the seventies and eighties, when it was so important, really most of those men are not with us anymore. A generation was wiped out by AIDS. Mm -hmm. And of course it like didn't, it did its worst damage in the gay business, get porn business. So I just feel like Buck like witnessed a, a moment in history and is still able to tell the story of what porn did to change lives. And I think it's really important. Um, you know, so I will say how I met Buck was also connected to the movie. I had, um, put together a little anthology, a book about circus of books, and it was really a, a great sort of artist book that lots of different people contributed to. And I just, you know, I didn't know that Buck was even sort of like, a lucid guy who's alive and well, who's able to be articulate, but I found his Instagram page and then I saw how inspiring he was on Instagram. So I just wrote to him and I said, Hey, would you mind, you know, would you be interested in like contributing anything at all about circus of books, like your memories of it, or, you know, a blurb, you know, one sentence maybe. And he just within a day had sent me the most beautiful piece of writing about how his experience walking into that store helped him change his own perception about himself you know and and buck really existed for many years in the gay space in the gay female space and then in the gay male space and one of the things that is so cool for me is that i remember the very first time i ever encountered a picture of buck it was in a magazine that my parents store carried and i just remember seeing it and being like wow this guy looks like i'm just my mind is blown it's you know the image of buck is so powerful so i reached out to him uh, when the film had its LA premiere and that's actually where we met. <laughs> so Buck has been on the journey with me of all the like promotion for the film for the last year and a half. And, um, it's been really awesome. I think, cause I've gotten to out the film, you know, put it out into the mainstream with a partner who's so proud of the work he did. And also it gave me the feeling of being really proud of the work that my parents did when they never expressed any pride in it. Right, right. Okay, uh, we are going to take a quick commercial break and we'll be right back. So hang tight. Holly Randall Unfiltered is brought to you by our friends at Manscaped. Do you or your partner desire a pair of smooth hairless balls, but you don't want to bring a razor down there because you don't want to damage your crown jewels in any way? This is where Manscaped comes to the rescue. Their electric trimmer, the Lawnmower 3.0, has proprietary skin safe technology that will not nick or snag your nuts, guaranteed. 
And plus they have so many other products to offer. They have stuff like their crop reviver and their crop preserver, which helps your balls not only smell amazing, but also prevents them from chafing, sticking, or sweating. So if you or somebody in your life wants to up your genital game and you don't want to use the same trimmer that you use on your face down there, make sure that you go to manscaped.com, use code Holly and get 20% off plus free shipping. That's manscaped.com, use code Holly for 20% off plus free shipping. And we are back. So before we take the break, Rachel, you mentioned about, you know, going on this whole promotional tour with your documentary and doing a lot of mainstream press. Mm-hmm. And how have you found that the documentary has been received by the mainstream? I mean, it's been mind blowing because I was, I mean, mind blowingly positive and I was expecting the big, bad, scary right wing Christian agenda to like show up and start pounding on my door, my parents. And like, you know, I'm just, it had never happened. And I don't know if that's because, you know, maybe the Christians weren't like given the outlet. I mean, there are plenty of Christians who have written me actually and saying great things like that this, you know, really changed their perspective on people who work in the business and all these things, which has been exactly my goal all along. My secret MO is to reveal how not horrible it is to be a pornographer. Um, (laughs) <laughs> and that the big, bad, scary Wizard of Oz people have, you know, the once the curtain comes up, you're not staring at like a porn fanged person. Um, but, you know, I've been amazed at the actual like critical reception. So I do have to say, maybe I do have to give myself a little salute to um, the, the quality of the film because I, I put together a team that I'm so proud of. My editor, my Catherine Robson, my producer, Cynthia Child, my DP. Gretchen Worthen, like basically we're in Oscars contention right now, which is completely nuts because the last time a film about porn was in Oscars contention that I can remember on this level was the people versus Larry Flint, which was, you know, like 20 years ago. I was just going to, I was thinking it's got to be that one. Yeah. And do you know, it's so weird because I'm like, I can't believe that there's been so few films that have just hit the mark. But I think my film does something that humanizes porn and it also allows a window into the gay world that people didn't have in this specific way. So I don't know, you know, I I think that there's many different factors that come into why the film has gotten the level of critical reception that it has. Um, But yeah, we we got nominated for an Emmy Award. And, you know, the the other people that have been nominated uh, with this film are like some of my favorite docs of the year. So like Don't Fuck With Cats, which was amazing. They won it. So I'm like, okay, we lost to like an awesome project. <laughs> How cool is that? Um, and it was an Emmy. Yeah. And, you know, I, I didn't expect that this film about porn would have, you know, about the Circus of Books, a gay porn store with my weird family tied to it, uh, would have appealed to a, a bigger community than like, you know, really the gay world of Los Angeles. I thought maybe that would be the core audience. And maybe if I was really lucky, I could get into like the out, uh, sorry, the, um, the one archives kind of like really academic institutions that could tell the story of, you know, of gay porn's role in, you know, helping for LGBT rights. That was kind of my, my lofty, my loftiest goal. It wasn't Oscars. It wasn't mainstream. So, you know, I, I'm really proud of the fact that the film has hit that because I think it's, um, I think it's actually something that redeems a lot of a lot of other people, not just my parents. Do you think that maybe the timing also too was kind of right? I feel like we're finally starting to see totally. people being more open to the idea that that sex work isn't this horrible oh, thing yeah. and that good people can work in the adult industry. No, totally. I mean, I think the timing, absolutely. And I, you know, I do have to say, when I think about what in the last couple of years or four years or so really allowed the mainstream a glimpse into porn, as it were, on, I mean, really mean like deep mainstream. Like, I have to mm-hmm. say, I give tons of credit actually to Stormy Daniels, who I know you know very well and whose doc 
hopefully is going to, you know, come to existence. I, I know I was uh, one of the directors that they're still potentially looking into um, working on it, but regardless if I get to direct it or not, I hope somebody makes a really powerful doc about Stormy because she did this thing for women in the porn industry in the mainstream to be looked at as smart, <laughs> funny, like powerful. And also like, wow, the balls to take down the most powerful man in the entire world at a time when this guy is clearly doing damage to so many people. You know, I know Donald Trump has tons of supporters and I, you know, I'm not going to actually talk shit about Trump supporters at all because, you know, there are actually good Trump supporters out there that I know personally. I'm thinking of the fact that she took it upon herself to fight him at the moment when he was just at his most powerful. And for me as a woman, I was so proud of seeing another woman have those kind of balls, but more so that she wasn't afraid to say that she was a porn star. I mean, I, I have to say, I wonder if that could have helped my film in some ways that people just, you know, their eyes were opened a little when they saw, you know, her on mainstream TV talking to Anderson Cooper and not sounding like their image of a ditzy porn star, you know, she was poised. So, Mm. um, I think that there's been these sort of cracks in the, in the surface image of what people see when they think about porn stars that are really because of, um, some of these players. And, and I will also say like Larry Flint is, is a complete genius. And I think he's done a lot just in his being a political activist, being someone who is smart and shows up and, you know, says articulate things. And who's also on the right side of LGBT historical causes, including being, you know, the first person to really distribute gay magazines to the mainstream. I was really happy to be able to show that Larry Flint, who people often think of as just a straight pornographer, actually did something very powerful for the gay community at a time when he didn't have to. I was going to ask you, so Larry Flint is featured in your film. What was it like to interview him? Well, you know, what was funny is that I think Larry Flint has always been in my parents sort of um, telling of the story, the kind of like big man that you never got to talk to and never got to meet. And he's just like over there. And, um, you know, he, I knew that they delivered hustler magazines and that's how they got their start. But what I didn't realize when I met Flint was two things is that I arranged the interview and it was very easy to arrange the interview, which I was told later was not ever the case with Larry Flint. He doesn't make things easy. He doesn't make it like you can just meet with him. I've met many people now who have not managed to get good, easy access to him. But when I put in my uh, request, Mm -hmm. you know, pretty quickly they were like, Oh yeah, sure. You know, when do you want to do this? And here's your, you know, I had to do all the jump through the hoops once we got started. But um, I realized when I met him face to face, how much respect he had and recognition he had for my parents that they had never, ever, ever intimated to me was the case. I always thought that like he, they knew him, but I didn't know that he knew them. And when he looked me right in the eye and was like, your parents basically helped start my business. You know, I remember them because I remember the people that were there with me in the beginning when there were not many people with me, you know, it was like that. It was that feeling of like, those were the original OG people in the seventies, there weren't many, you know, and I, I, it's it's cool to like talk to you too, Holly, because I'm like, your mom was one of them too. But it's funny, like she was well known. Like my parents were like the underground people who Larry Flint was still fond of. And he, after the interview was like, you know, tell your parents, I really want to see them. Like make sure they make an appointment with my secretary. We'll have lunch together. And, you know, as soon as I got back, I I said that to my mom, she was like, he doesn't want to have lunch with us. He just said that. And I'm like, mom, Larry Flint doesn't just invite people to lunch. Larry Flint doesn't just say, (laughs) yeah, he doesn't just say anything. Right. Like if he doesn't want to have lunch with you, he will not invite you to lunch. It's not going to happen. It's not even a thing that would ever come out. So so the thing that blew my mind was just that my mom's inability to she like willfully acts like she's not a player in this industry where actually she is a player and people really respect her. So I, I I guess in some ways I wanted to like challenge that so hard. And, and, and then when I, you know, it's funny when I met Buck and 
and, and through Buck met my, you know, sort of all the people in the industry that I really hadn't met. Like I went to my first big award shows with Buck and I'm meeting people, you know, he introduced me to the first woman we met, like she, he, she has a PhD and she's an author and, you know, all these different people that are like, these are the porn people, you know? Yes. There's, a, there's plenty of people that don't have PhDs or are not authors and, you know, might just be in it for a few years, but there's a wealth of really fantastically interesting people who are maverick individuals in the porn world. And so, you know, I just feel so excited to be able to, um, you know, be a part of that and, and recognize it. Cause it's sort of like, I always knew it was there, but I didn't fully have the chance to, it was like, I couldn't prove it until I did the film. Did you, do you think that you helped your parents recognize how influential they were? Like, did they not really see it until you made the documentary? You know, I think so. I think my dad in particular, yes, because I mean, I will say my dad is like the most <laughs> charmed guy in the world. Like he, he would have totally been fine. Never leaving his parents' house in Burbank and working at a little camera store. You know, my dad just sort of is happy and content with anything in the world and, and enjoyed the store and, and, and would have not necessarily cared one way or another if the store, um, you know, had an impact or not, but he's been so amazed and mystified and sort of proud of the fact that the store had this great life. And so my dad, as he always does sort of has this beautiful, wonderful attitude about everything. And my mom actually is, it's not like she has the opposite attitude, but she spent so many years, I think, trying to just be a good mom. And in her mind, a good mom doesn't deal in gay porn. And so I have to make sure none of my friends know about this and especially nobody in my religious community. And then none of my religious friends who are in P flag. So all these layers that my mom spent years sort of like baking onto herself, you know, almost like you're, you're like hardened with the shell, I think I've just been really hard for her to shed. And so she's been, you know, when we were touring the film, she would go on to a stage and bring an actual standing ovation and people would be giving my parents the standing ovation, but it was a particular ovation for my mom because she revealed so much in the film about her struggle and her journey that I think many people felt, but my mom even says like, I feel very uncomfortable taking credit for this because we were not activists. We didn't set out. I didn't set out to be an activist in this way. I just set out to, you know, try to raise my family and try to have, you know, the store function. Like she set out to be a good businesswoman. And I think for her, she is very proud of her employees that have gone to college that, you know, the store launched their career in different ways. Like she's just very proud of like the, the employees that she sees as like, in a way, other kids. Like, I think she felt like a, there were like two families she balanced the family at home, my family, and then the, the family of the, the porn world in, in the store. So I think on some level for my mom, it's been a really interesting thing for me to witness. And I think she's been very uncomfortable with the adulation. <laughs> How, um, how was making the documentary um, for your relationship with your mom? Did you start out, did you start out thinking the documentary was going to be one thing? And then did it, and I guess these are actually two entirely different questions, or maybe they're the same question, I don't know. But did you start off with the documentary thinking you were going to be doing one thing, and then it ended up becoming something else? And then my second question, and again, this might be the same question, mm -hmm. How did it affect your relationship with your mother? Um, did you learn more about your mother? Did you have a greater understanding of her? Did it bring you guys closer? Yeah, well, to answer the first one, um, 100%, I thought I was going to make a film that probably, when I think about it now, really would have only appealed to, you know, people that care about like porn history and like gay history. <laughs> and I really was thinking about like the distinctions between the two stores, Silver Lake and West Hollywood, and maybe like the different production companies that like, you know, connected to the porn industry at the time when there were hardly any gay, you know, erotic 
places to make work at all. So I was thinking about a much more sort of nerdy film that, that would have interested people that already have some knowledge of, you know, the porn world and, and the LGBT struggle. Um, I never set out to make a film that turned inwards and looked at me and my mom and our relationship and my brother, but it really was a testament to the fact that I had a great producer who actually was co-directing with me in the beginning, Cynthia Childs. And, you know, I just, I flat out said, I don't know what I'm doing. And you help, could you help me? Cause I just, I know I need to make this film because the store is going to close. And I really, you know, in some ways, like she mentored me to like figure out how to make this film um, and I had this incredible camera woman that started following me around and she was just really focusing the camera on me and my mom. And I kept feeling like, God, why are you, why are you looking at me right now with your camera? Like focus on my mom, but it would be because my mom was like yelling at me or saying like, Rachel, get that camera off me. Like, just, I have to work, you know, stop it with your stupid documentary. Like I'm on, I'm working right now. Like, what are you doing? <laughs> And, and my DP was like finding that that was part of the dynamic. Like your mom doesn't understand what you're doing, but ironically what she does is pretty out there. And most people look at like your mom walking through the expo, like buying piles of dildos and talking to all these people. Clearly she knows pretending like she's never been there before. <laughs> that was in her life. A great scene. You know? Yeah. And she's like, I've never seen any of these. And then she cuts to like piles of cock rings in the back room, you know? And like, I don't know what any of this looks like. <laughs> And, and in a weird way, it is this amazing contradiction of like, well, I don't know. Can you, Jorge, could you help me find a guy that, like on this DVD cover? They don't want penetration and it has to be a white guy. I can't really say it. I'm like, show, she shows it to me. You know, and I, like for me, these, there were these moments when my DP was catching my mom talking to me in this way that is so funny that only would happen with a person that's so deeply in the world of gay porn you know, that they can't even see this like raging hard on, on this guy, like fucking another guy. And then there's this, you know, this other shot. And it's hilarious because we let the camera roll on the interaction between mother daughter at those moments. And I think that's like the scandalous piece of it. But, um, you know, that, that was the result of just what happens when you make a documentary and you let the footage that the, that's the good footage speak for itself. So, you know, you can set out to say, I'm going to make this documentary and it's going to be this, but I really think the best filmmakers are actually the least almost like involved in the film. If, if that sounds weird to say, it's like, there's a fine line between, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to make everything happen. I'm going to make this happen and this happen and this happen. And then you actually make the film and the film says, Hey, Rachel, so you wanted to make this happen. Well, guess what? The really cool footage is. Uh, all this stuff of your mom in the basement and not the stuff of like, you know, these moments that you thought were so great, but this right here. So for me, that's where, you know, the art of filmmaking comes in where like you can spend two weeks setting up a shot and actually the best shot is the one that you've taken with your camera on the day that you almost didn't think you were going to shoot anything. So you have to, you have to just recognize what the best footage is the best moments are and weave that together. And I think, you know, I think that's how so much of it came together where my mom and I are part of the story. So to answer the question about our relationship, I mean, in a funny way, I think my mom ended up realizing that I was a decent businesswoman, which to me was the highest compliment of my whole life. One day she said to me, and it was after I'd gotten the Netflix deal. I had managed a budget that was like you know, $300,000 and I'm paying people on the back end. And even me, I was like, I don't know how to do this, but I know that I have like a $25,000 archival bill and I've got to figure out how to pay for it. But I know that this is going to sell to Netflix. So maybe I can hold off on this. And, you know, all these big, powerful things that I only had ever heard my mom talk about doing were things I had to do to make this movie. And when you make a movie and you're directing and producing it, you're basically like running a business. And I, you know, I had an LLC that I created to do this. And, and I remember at one point, my mom just said, you know, you're not a bad business person, actually. <laughs> and I remember being like, oh my God, I don't care about compliments for my mom. Well, they don't ever come actually. But that one was like, I just felt like so earth shattering. I'm like, she actually gave me the comp, the one compliment that really means something to her. <laughs> like being good at business is a very big yeah. deal to my mom. So I just, 
that that was like okay that was cool <laughs> It was like, oh I God. got the one validation. I have to say I your needed. story about. Hmm. Sorry. Yeah. I was just laughing because that story about your mom and the dildos just reminds <laughs> me of a story about my mom and dildos. You really? know, since we're going to swap mom dildo stories, yeah. my mom like hates dildos. She hates dildos. <laughs> she hates vibrators, right? I don't know. She's just thinking about it. She was very offensive. So, you know, we would shoot, but we would shoot a lot of scenes with dildos or vibrators and I remember I had shot something and I think I had accidentally left some like dildos or vibrators out and she got really frustrated and angry with me. And she got this bucket of like ammonia and took like everything and threw it in there, like with the idea that she was cleaning it. But of course it leaked into the battery compartment for all oh. the vibrators. So she ruined all of my vibrators. Oh my God. And I just remember discovering this bucket and being so angry with her and being like, mom, <laughs> you ruined all my vibrators. And she's like, well, you shouldn't be leaving them around. And we had this big fight about it. And in the back of my mind, I'm thinking my mom and I are fighting about vibrators right now. This is See, really now, strange. If you look at it from like an outside perspective. Now I, my, my filmmaker heart is breaking because that needed to be documented and would have been an <laughs> iconic shot for a doc that you make about your mom. So just so you know, keep those cameras rolling, Holly, because that is exactly, <laughs> that is exactly I'll just leave the, some vibrators the legacy. laying around the house. Yeah. I mean, the funniest <laughs> thing off. is how do you replay that? I mean, you can actually retell that story and, and, and do a recreate, but like the funniest thing is like, <laughs> that's why you have to have you're, um, you have to have the cameras rolling. That is an awesome story. Although I do want to understand that better. Does she just like not like them in terms of photography and like porn photography? It just doesn't like them in general. Like they're not, they're not products she thinks are worthy. Good. <laughs> That's a great question. I think it's kind of like a little bit of both. It's kind of, you know what I think it is? She's very much rooted in like the old classic glamour porn where you're just shooting like spreads and that kind of stuff. And and introducing toys and dildos was kind of like a new, I don't know, mm. like 90s, 2000 trend that she just wasn't, she just wasn't into. I think it just, she felt like it kind of ruined the the beauty of of the shot. I don't know. Or maybe it felt like product placement or something like it was impure in that way. Yeah. Yeah. She just, uh, I don't know. She just didn't, she just didn't like uh -huh. it. See, I, I want to probe into this. Okay. But that's for another conversation. <laughs> I find that interesting. No, but it is really generational. I mean, I think that's what you guys have in your story. That's fascinating. It's like a generational um, legacy in porn, which is amazing. You know, I, and that's what I think is interesting about all these kinds of stories right now. Like I'm realizing with LGBT history, there's many stories that haven't been told. Why? Because it was an underground culture. You couldn't just be gay. You know, in, in 1950s America to be gay was to get electroshock therapy and you were like literally going to get a lobotomy, you know, Ryan Murphy, who I'm so lucky mm -hmm. executive produced my film. Um, his, you know, his sequences that he does in these like amazing fictional TV shows that deal with early gay history, you know, like in Ratched, you see like a guy getting electroshock therapy for being gay. Like that really happened. It's actually real. So, you know, we now look at like, well, why have those stories not been told? Well, because people who were being treated like, you know, were being tortured like that, they, they didn't have any ability to you know, tell their stories, write books and, and docu make documentaries. So same thing for porn people, you know, we're not, I mean, I'll say I'll include myself in a little bit of being a porn person, you know, having grown up with under pornographers, but porn people were similarly shamed. So they weren't out there like telling their stories to the world. I mean, I know that there's like a handful of these iconic, amazing, you know, like, um, the Xavier, um, Hollander book from the seventies. I remember I found that and I was like, wow, this is like a woman revealing her stories about being a sex worker, but they're rare. There really were not a lot of people telling those stories. So again, that's why, you know, when I think of like the people that have broken through into the mainstream and like revealed the porn star who is just a person to the world, you know, that's, that is where it's Stormy Daniels. And I also will say that's Buck Angel. You know, he, in recent years has become like an activist who 
addict who's just out there talking about like, hey, yeah, I make porn. And like, I'm not a scary weirdo. Like I'm a guy who struggled with being trans and I make porn. And it's actually a story that's like any other story in the world to tell. So, you know, I think because people in the porn industry have spent so many years under the cloud of shame, the stories haven't been told yet. So I think it's really important that people in this industry, you know, follow in my footsteps and um, share their stories. Yeah, I love that. All right, guys, we're going to take our very last commercial break and then we're going to come right back. So hang tight. If you're here, it's probably because you're a fan of my podcast, Holly Randall Unfiltered. Well, that's great because I'm a fan of my podcast too. Now, if you don't know what Patreon is, it's a crowdfunding platform that allows people to make contributions on a monthly basis. Because this podcast costs money to make, maybe even more so than others. I'm obsessed with quality. So since the beginning, I have always recorded in a studio, had a professional sound engineer, and recorded professional video. All of these things cost money, as you can imagine. And I also made a pretty scary decision this year to cut down on my directing gigs so that I could focus more on this podcast, which is why I need your help now more than ever. But don't worry, I'm not asking you to give me something for nothing. In exchange for your contributions, I offer so many perks. For example, access to the live streams of all of my interviews, a bonus podcast that I do called My LA Porn Life, Q and A's where the stars answer your specific questions, behind the scenes interviews, merchandise such as mugs, shirts, and stickers, access to my private Snapchat, and so much more. You can join for as little as $5 a month and help me change the way the world sees the adult industry and sex work. So take a look around and see everything that I have to offer. I really hope that you'll join and be a part of our little community. Hello, everybody. We are back. So, Rachel, we touched a little bit upon the like darker sides of um, the adult industry and your parents' uh, career. In you know, we talked about the AIDS ec- epidemic, but there was also um, some other almost tragedies that befell your family, which included your father almost going to jail. Can you tell us about that story? Yeah. And, you know, I, as I realized this, um, so the, the guy who defended my parents is somebody that many people in the porn world know really well, John Weston. And he, uh, rest in peace, John, I hope you are having fun out there, um, in the other dimension. He died recently. And basically, um, told me that he had no, he had no assurance whatsoever that my parents, when they got busted for selling the craziest, most soft core, like three VHS that by today's standards could probably be uploaded to YouTube and pass. I mean, it was like the most ridiculous pile of videos that they sent to an area where it's illegal to have pornography. Um, they got busted by the FBI. It was a huge, ridiculous sting operation but John Weston, their lawyer, told me he didn't have any assurances whatsoever based on his track record and the difficulties with many other people in the industry that he, my dad, or my mom, or both of them wouldn't go to jail for possibly quite a while, like five years. It was not like short time. It would be hard time, like a good chunk of time for doing that, for, for selling over state lines. And had that happened, I was in, I think, uh, seventh grade at the time. So it would have been like my entire high school experience uh, that my dad wouldn't have been around. And for me and my two brothers and and possibly my mom too. And so I just find it like the hypocrisy when I think about the, the Christian right. And, you know, I shouldn't just harp on Christian, but like the idea of the right wing that comes down upon, you know, the porn world, quote unquote, as like, anti-family values because my parents couldn't have been more strongly family values oriented people. I mean, I actually don't know anyone that's even more family oriented than my parents truly. And they would have been taken away from me and our family would have been destroyed by those same people trying to make a claim for the impact of porn on family values. And so 
you know, I really do have a bone to pick when last year filling out the COVID fucking federal relief application, you, if it said, I'm sure you might've seen this, but if you work in the sex industry, you're not eligible. You are not eligible for COVID relief. And I'm sitting here with Buck who works in the sex industry, pays taxes. My parents pay tons of taxes. I mean, what is uh, just more, just pure discriminatory than that? Like just pure, utter discrimination. And so, I mean, it's just so amazing. We have this battle to this day that is just a basic battle. Like we've fought a lot of battles and, and won them. And yet we haven't won this one. Like it was on federal relief applications that you couldn't work in the sex industry. So I was so deeply offended by that for everybody that I know who works and is an American. I mean, actual American taxpaying citizens, and we're not given that basic, just humanitarian right to try to get, you know, some federal relief. And people in porn have suffered really badly this last year. So just to come back to, you know, what my parents dealt with in the 80s, it's like that problem is still there today, but in a different in a different way. You know, they're not like busting people right now for um, selling VHS, but they're not letting them get federal relief. So, you know, I do have to say the vindication for me about this film being an Oscars contender is that when things get like in that space of being talked about for the Oscars, it's usually because there's something um historical to point to that's like a reckoning and for me the the workers in the sex industry and when uh aoc alexandria um ocasio cortez recently made a tweet that said sex work is work it gave me a feeling of like okay this might actually be one of those causes for the moment we are living in like we've we've achieved lgbt rights we've achieved rights for women we've achieved rights for minorities in all these different ways and you know we have not achieved rights for sex workers like full unequivocal basic rights for people in the sex work industry that's not there yet and how fucked up is that so i'm really proud of circus of books for being you know a little champion of that cause Um, And to say it's made up of people like human beings, (laughs) these women that are so gorgeous are also just human beings who might be trying to pay their bills. I mean, they actually are trying to pay their bills (laughs) and the government needs to help them. (laughs) Yeah. So, I mean, based on, on everything that you just said, um, and despite, you know, the fact that uh, people in the sex industry were denied Um, federal funding um, due to the COVID pandemic. Are you hopeful for the future of the adult industry? Yeah, I'm really hopeful. I mean, I'm really hopeful because of people like you, people like Buck, people who are like also humanizing and giving voice to the people who work within it. You know, I think for our parents' generation, like the adult industry was often like very top down. It was like the Hugh Hefners and Larry Flint's and the people under them that called the shots and made the rules. But like the fact that like, you know, women can have their own production companies and make their own movies. And like, there are females that are powerful in the industry as well as males in the industry that there's trans people doing a whole genre unto themselves. And there's, you know, industries within industries now. Um, so I'm, I'm hopeful that there's an empowered you know, group of people making their content. And um, I feel like that's awesome. And I definitely feel like there's still many battles and hurdles. And, um, you know, I think there's, there's subsects of problems that are tangential to the porn industry. But one of the things that I have to say is my biggest gripe is that, you know, when I'm getting, when I get interviewed in the mainstream about porn, I'll, I'll sometimes get questions that are just so upsetting, but I get the opportunity to shed light on their mis, um, miscalculations. And so um, I get often asked like, well, how do you feel about the fact that your parents are involved in an industry that um, promotes pedophilia and sex trafficking? And I say to them, that is like saying to a restaurant owner, how do you feel about being in an industry that promotes food poisoning? You know, and um, <laughs> and like, you know, because truly like, 
okay, yeah, there are food poisoning outbreaks and they're terrible when that happens. And most restaurants work really hard to prevent that and, you know, food safety and they work really hard around that. And so in the porn industry, I'm able to tell, you know, the mainstream, like, actually, just so you know, there's no one in the world that cares more about pedophilia than people in the porn industry, because it is so disruptive and horrible that that first off that stigma exists. Secondly, they genuinely care. People in porn don't want any of this. That's why every single thing you do has to say over 18, you have to have major blockades. You know, it's truly like comparing the food of food poisoning to, you know, saying that that's everyone that works in the food industry. So we are colored with this very dark image, you know, and sex trafficking. Oh my God, it's a horrible thing. I don't like sex trafficking. And this industry has nothing to do with it. (laughs) Sorry, go ahead. And the, the irony with that too, is that human trafficking most often happens in the labor sections. Not mm-hmm. in sex trafficking. I mean, you're talking about human trafficking. That's usually a huge problem, you know, on farms and mm. um, in in food production. So, you know, sex trafficking is a small part of the overall problem of of human trafficking. And then also, too, you know, what you said about uh, pedophilia is that. Yeah, I mean, it's this idea that, you know, the people who work in the adult industry that like that we want to harm and sexualize children, which is insane. I mean, people in the adult industry are, as your documentary obviously shows so well, their parents and their families right. and they have children that they don't want to be trafficked or to be sexually exploited in any way. So, so you're right. You know, the, it's, it's very unfortunate that we have that stigma attached to us because you know, in, and obviously there's always going to be like CD underbellies and subsex and, and that kind of thing. But when you're talking about like the mainstream kind of porn industry, you know, the people that you and I work with and know, and, and the majority of the industry, um, we're all absolutely horrified by sex trafficking, pedophilia, all that kind of thing. Well, and I think one of the things maybe to throw it out there, because it also, shames the consumers of porn. And that's like the one thing that I think I'm the most Mm -hmm. annoyed by. It's like, you know, my mom used to always say this, I wouldn't sell this if people didn't buy it. (laughs) So when people say to my mom, like, well, how dare you sell this thing? She's like, I'm not selling something that is just this thing I created and then pushed into the world. People want it. And I'm thinking to myself, like, why do we shame this thing? Like we eat, we have to eat. We're all cool with that, right? Like we do. (laughs) No one's getting shamed for eating. We have to sleep. We have to, we actually have to have sex. We have to. We're human beings. You know, if you're straight, men have to stare at women. It's a thing and it's totally cool. It's like actually part of our biology, you know, and gay men will stare at other men. And that's actually cool. And I feel like, I mean, I do have to say, maybe it's because in the gay world, there's a sense of liberation that exists because it was so transgressive already to just be fucking gay. Like that's, you know, you're already breaking a big rule in society, but I will say this, like, because I feel sometimes Mm -hmm. like there's a shaming that comes hard. Of course, the shaming on women in porn is so grotesque to me. Like uh, it, it comes from like the idea that we have like this Mary Magdalena, you know, the, the fallen woman, just this image of like what we're trying to get women to do. And like, how dare they be sexual? Like that's not okay. So a whore, a slut, all this stuff, first off, secondly, for the people that consume it. And especially if they're men, you know, these are guys who are just like any other guy in the world. They actually just admire women. Like that's a part of biology. That's a part of life. And in a way it's awesome. It's good. I'm cool with it. Not only am I cool with it. I think it's great. I think it's fucking awesome, Holly, that you know how to take amazing pictures of beautiful women and make them feel comfortable in front of the camera. Like that's so awesome. What if we just actually changed the narrative and said, and it's awesome that people want to watch that and look at it. And they're not going out and raping women because they saw your pictures. If anything, maybe they admire women even more because they saw your picture. There's just this thing that you can change the narrative and say, you're actually doing something awesome. You're doing something good. It's like you're baking a really nice cake. You didn't make something shitty. (laughs) You made something really good and people are going to eat it and enjoy it. Like, I love that. Like, why is it problematic to make really good, high quality, beautiful porn. 
that to me is an awesome thing and it's nothing to be afraid of. And, and I, to come back to Buck and what he did and why he's so powerful in it is that as a trans guy, breaking every rule of society <laughs> and then also breaking that final rule, which is like being sexual. It's like, there's a free, there's a freedom to that. But I think for straight people where you haven't broken a fundamental rule of our culture, you know, you're doing this thing that is normal, quote unquote, to, you know, men and women procreating, but then just indulging in the fantasy world is not a sin at all. It's totally cool. So if there's one thing I would advocate for, yeah. it's just for us to start changing the narrative around porn so that we appreciate it as a part of our culture. It's existed in our society for centuries. <laughs> The yeah, end. and the great thing about <laughs> porn nowadays is, is <laughs> well, the great thing is that technology has really allowed performers to take so much control over their careers. So these women that you see in these in these porn movies now that you know a society so often you know frames in this idea that they are all victims. They are the ones who are controlling their image. They're able to sell their product directly to the consumer via you know these OnlyFans and these camming sites and they really, you know, have become such powerful agents of their own destiny. And, um, you know, I think now is, is the one time that you really can view porn and know that, you know, so much of what you see are these women who are truly like empowered by what they do and are actively engaged in their own career and, and really enjoy it and are making out very well financially from that. You know, it's been, it's been, um, it's been a good couple of years for sex workers and it will only continue to, to be that way. So, um, my last question for you is how has making this documentary affected you as a person? How has it changed you? And maybe what is the greatest lesson you've learned? Well, you know, before I set out to make the film, I was an artist and my goal was to be in the, in just the pure arts. I, I mean, I was a songwriter. I still am. I mean, it's in my, blood to do that i i just set out one of your songs is featured in the doc right yeah the end credit song is one of my songs and you know i love doing it i love making music i love performing i love singing i love doing all these things and um i guess what i realized with making the doc was that like the career i imagined i was going to have where i was just going to keep going down that road and keep working with other artists and keep working in the sphere of the arts well i'm now doing that but in a different genre. I'm in the film world and I'm actually kind of a, a, a cool new person on the block in the film world because I come out of the arts and I, you know, I, I, I've noticed that what I had thought might be a handicap for me, like, okay, well, I don't really know what I'm doing because I had never made a documentary before. Well, actually all of my visual training as an artist and all of my, you know, work in creative worlds has fed into my ability to kind of have a little bit of a superpower when I go into the space, because I work with people that have sort of their blinders on and they've done everything in a certain way. And I walk in and say, well, I know what's going to make it really look amazing. So for myself, the biggest thing that I've learned is that I have the possibility of a whole different path ahead of me. And I've been, you know, now I'm working on new films and new projects and I can encourage other people and be a mentor. And like, you know, I was not that person a couple of years ago, I was more of just this um, weirdo artist, you know, operating in a more underground space with other avant-garde weirdos. And I guess in some ways, another little piece of my journey is that I, I had a kind of disdain for the mainstream because I was always sort of a countercultural type. And, um, and now I'm like, you know what, fucking a, the mainstream is changing and it's, it's embracing the weirdos and it's bringing out cool stories that like people want to hear from, you know, like the, the, the Renaissance of Netflix documentaries is because people want to hear the really offbeat stories about like the little gay porn store down the street that was like run by religious people who knew, you know, that's, what's exciting to me is that I've learned that we have a whole new world ahead of us in, in media. And, um, you know, for me personally, I've, I've grown because of that. Yeah. And how incredibly cool is it that you get to ride this wave, yeah. you know, of, um, of, of being this new kind of transgressive, um, counterculture, uh, in the mainstream. 
Um, Rachel, thank you so much. This has been a really, really cool conversation and it was so yeah. good to connect with you. No, can thank you, you let everybody me. know? Mm-hmm. Can you let everybody know where they can find you online? Totally. So if you are on Instagram, my name is future clown. That's the words future and clown <laughs> merged together. Future clown is me on Instagram and, um, on Twitter, I'm Rachel Mason art. And on Facebook, you can do the same thing. Facebook.com slash Rachel Mason art. And then on YouTube, I think I'm Rachel Mason rocks is the YouTube account that has my music on it, but you can also find me on Spotify, Rachel Mason. So pretty much Google. If you forget everything about this conversation, you can look me up on Google, Rachel Mason. And, um, you know, I'm really excited also about the future of more stories that are going to come out of the world that you're involved in, Holly. So thank you for being such a powerful advocate for people in the industry. It's awesome and powerful work that you're doing. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Yeah. Um, you guys can follow me at Holly Randall on Instagram and on Twitter. Of course, to support this podcast, go to patreon.com slash Holly Randall unfiltered. Make sure that you go watch Circus of Books now streaming on Netflix. It's an amazing documentary, absolutely well worth your time. And uh, Rachel, thank you so much. And good luck with the uh, being an Oscar contender. That's so Thanks. fucking cool. I mean, yeah, it is. Amazing honor. <laughs> Thanks. I know it's such an honor. I'm, I'm freaking out just to even be spoken of in this world. So it's, it's a yeah. big win for everyone in our industry, I think. So absolutely. Awesome. Cool. Absolutely. All right. Thank you so much, guys. I will see you next week. This episode of Holly Randall Unfiltered is brought to you by Manscaped. Now, we all love body hair on a man, but you still got to keep that under control. So in addition to Manscaped's Lawnmower 3.0, which is their revolutionary electric trimmer for your nuts, they will not nick or snag them. They have recently also come out with their Weed Whacker. This is an electric trimmer for your ears and your nose two other parts of your body that you definitely need to keep the hair under control. So go to manscaped.com, use code Holly and get 20% off plus free shipping.